Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Soldiers of Cinema podcast. I'm Colin McFader, and I'm from Toronto, Canada, and this is Clark Coffey joining me from sunny California, Hello. Orange County. How are you doing? Uh, doing all right, man. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Awesome. Um, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, just say a little bit about yourself. Ah, and, okay, uh, throwing it back over to me. Well, yeah, everybody, uh, you certainly don't know who we are. Uh, yet, but <laughs> but we'll, we'll we'll tell you a little bit about ourselves so that you kind of have an idea of who we are and where we're coming from uh, as we start our series of podcasts that we're going to uh, basically dedicate to the discussion of Werner Herzog and uh, initially his masterclass that he's got on masterclass.com, which Colin and I uh, both have done and actually met through. Uh, and then we'll probably end up discussing uh, his films and his writings. And he's got several books that he's authored. And he's done uh, an endless number of interviews, uh, both in print and on uh, in video. But we're going to kind of go use all of that material uh, as a jumping off point to discuss uh, film, film philosophy, filmmaking, uh, even like creative process, philosophy of art, and uh, maybe even just a little, you know, application to life in general. So a little bit of background about me. Uh, I, like Cullen said, I'm out here in Orange County, California. I am a uh, pursuing a career in filmmaking. I have only been doing so, though, for about 10 years. Um, I'm in my mid-40s, so I started pretty late. I used to work in advertising, didn't like it, uh, felt like it was kind of sucking the soul out of my body, uh, and I had always wanted to be a filmmaker, and I'd always loved film. So I decided to set out to try to be an actor because that's what I saw on camera, that's what I or saw on screen, and that was kind of the most immediately recognizable role in the world of filmmaking for me and uh, I did that for about like like singularly for about eight years and uh, boy do I have some really <laughs> wacky stories from that experience but actually I mean it was a very great experience but uh, as I kind of pursued that career in acting more and more and more I realized you know I'm gonna have to to take on some of these other roles um, that exist in the world of filmmaking if I'm going to do anything uh, in this industry instead of just, you know, waiting for somebody uh, to invite me to act. I thought, you know, maybe I can start to write my own stuff. Maybe I can, you know, direct my own stuff, produce my own stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And so more and more I was exposed to these different uh, roles uh, and uh, actually ended up really loving a lot of these things. Although writing still scares the crap out of me, but, but mm -hmm. I, <laughs> really, really, really love directing. And so I've kind of been putting my energy more towards that. But I'm certainly, you know, I, I would say in the beginning of, of my career, but I have uh, written and directed um, and acted uh, in quite a few uh, performances for the stage. And then over the past, you know, eight years or so uh, in front of and behind of the camera uh, from short films to um uh, to even uh, now recently I'm uh, directing and producing a handful of documentary and narrative features that I'm uh, in, in progress on. So, yeah, I don't know. In a nutshell, there's me. Ta-da! Cullen! Well, yeah, I, uh, I've got less years than you, but um, uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I similar. I started, I, I was interested in film as, as a kid. I got really interested um, around the time I was five or six um, and I would use the old uh, you know, high eight video camera that we had at home, um, to make movies. Um, and, but as a kid, you know, and going even up to high school, I primarily did more acting kind of similarly to you. Um, and that was not out of a desire to be an actor. Um, but it was more out of when you're a kid, yeah, it's easier to act than it is to make a movie because of course, you know, there's a little bit more behind being a director than it is just to, you know, go join a spring play or yeah. something like that, or a, a school play. So yeah, I did a lot of acting basically since when I was a kid. Um, I did a lot of improv stuff with like Second City and places like that. And then when I was in high school, I went to a kind of notable arts high school just outside of Toronto. Um, and You're so I a took, fame kid. Yeah, it's so like, I, took, uh... I took a four, four years of like intensive acting school there. Um, wow. But I also knew that I never wanted to be, you know, an actor. I, I, I'd acted in a few things and I'd done a lot of stage, but I never, I always wanted to be um you know, behind the camera instead of in front of it. So all that while as a kid, I was making dozens and dozens of short films. Um, and now I, uh, I teach a film class, 
Um, I work primarily as like a freelance cinematographer and I direct a lot of my own stuff. I've got my own company up here in Toronto. Awesome. Um, that I make films first or through and, and uh, we're actually just gearing up on our first feature now, which is really exciting. That will be my kind of directorial debut when it comes to feature territory. So excited awesome. about that. Yeah, uh, that's super cool. Well, that's going to be uh, really interesting, uh, different, you know, kind of different histories, different perspectives that we can kind of bring to this analysis and discussion. It's uh, so interesting that you actually did go to an art school. I, I did not. And it's really interesting that you uh, teach uh, a, a film class because... Uh, that's a big part of what uh, Herzog discusses here in these first couple lessons that we can mm-hmm. jump into. But before we do, I want to draw some attention to the name of our podcast, which is Soldiers of Cinema. And of course, we did not just make that bu- make that up on our own, as cool as it is, but uh, we got that from Herzog himself. And yeah. uh, and he, you know, not just in this masterclass, but if you go back, I, you know, I, I think that he's used this phrase uh, quite often, you know, f- over the past numerous decades. I love it. I think that it's a, an awesome descriptor of what my my hopes would be or my ideal would be as a filmmaker, what I would you know hope to achieve would, would be a soldier of cinema. Um, but what does that mean to you? What do you think Herzog means? And what, if anything, does that mean to you, Colin? Um, I mean, on, on, a, on a very uh, basic level, I think it's about not doing anything passively. I think it's about being very active in you know something that you like if it's a creative output and of course this being specifically about cinema and about film um i think it's about you know if you're making something you're fully invested in it you are you are a soldier you're you're you would you know crawl through the trenches on all fours to get uh, a shot you would uh you would you would put your heart and soul into the projects that you're doing yeah. Um, as opposed to, again, as I said, just kind of being passive about it or just using it as a paycheck and, and kind of meandering the nine to five job um, that you can technically turn a film career into. Um, <laughs> but I think it's about kind of uh, which is hard to rejecting believe. that. It yeah. was like, I, I, you know, it's hard to believe. But yeah, and I think just, you know, it's an interesting analogy too. just, you know, on, on many different levels, how, although I have never been to war, and so I would never try to presume that I would know what that experience is like. Uh, and so in no ways trying to diminish, you know, what, a, you know, that actual experience. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think a lot of people use that analogy for what making a film is kind of like, whether it's, you know, just pre-production trying to get funding or trying to get hired or you know at every step actually making the film i mean it is kind of seems sometimes like you're just fighting against you know nature itself almost the creative process can really be a profoundly challenging one and of Mm -hmm. course it's profoundly rewarding but uh yeah and sometimes your uh your fellow filmmakers feel like brothers and sisters in arms because it is such a challenge you know um, but we'll, we can kind of bring that up in different ways over, over time. And it's also, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of points or, of, there's a lot of points of conflict maybe between your ideals, your integrity and, um, and compromise. Even your uh, vision, you know, <laughs> that right, right. And of course, certainly one of the things that Herzog is known for and he stands out for, and he's an inspiration to me is his, his lack of compromise, how, mm-hmm. How ever I don't think I don't think that you could point to any one of his many many films and say, oh, that was a compromised product. That and this, never, I mean, and every, it's never from a place of disrespect either, which is really admirable. Yeah, it's yeah, always it, a mutual understanding of like, okay, you've got to do your job, I've got to do my job. How can we both get what we want out of this? Well, um, or yeah, or hers. But it, it, yeah, I think he's just uh, it, he's an extraordinary example of you know. Uh, of a person pursuing his vision, vision endlessly. Uh Um, and I think that, uh, it's extraordinary. We don't have many filmmakers or many artists period, uh, like that, at least, you know, that are widely known because, uh, often it, it requires such great compromise, uh, whether, you know, whoever's paid for the film, your investors, the studio, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's just extremely difficult to make a film of any size without having just, you know, thousands of points of significant compromise. Um, 
So yeah, it's uh, I, so that's why we picked it. Uh, it'd be interesting to to know what other people's interpretations of Soldier of Cinema are. I'm sure that this is going to come back because uh, it's it's such an interesting phrase that describes kind of an overall philosophy or theme. But let's go into some other things that that uh, Herzog discusses in these first couple lessons. Uh, and one of the big things he talks about is that he he mentions he's self taught. Um, mm-hmm. And, and pretty proud of that, I think. And and he kind of just comes right out and says, he's like, you know, I don't think that film film school is worth it. Uh, it's expensive. And I think that you can, uh, paraphrasing Herzog here, of course, <laughs> but, but that, you know, you can kind of teach yourself everything that you need to know, at least logistically, to make a film in just a couple weeks. Um, and after that, it's, you know, take the money that you would have spent on film school and spend that on making your own films. And no, a lot of other people think this too. Um, but uh, let's kind of discuss that for a minute. What do you think, Cullen? I mean, well, as I mean, somebody, you know, you you, can, you didn't go to like film school per se, but you went no, to a performing no. art school and you, you teach film yourself in certain capacities. So like, what are your thoughts on that, on Herzog's uh, take here? Yeah, I think... Um... I think it kind of allows you almost when you're not in, I think film schools are, are great. And what I always tell my students is that, you know, you can go and just, just look at what you learn, look at the curriculums and look at things like that. And, and if you would learn something, then it has value. Um, but I think that the benefit that at least I've found of, of not going to film school and never, like I've never taken film in an educational environment or anything like that mm-hmm. um, is, is kind of the freedom to not have to worry about a lot of rules. Um, and I don't mean safety rules. Of course, safety is always really important. But I mean more in terms of, of there, there's certain things that, that um, what I notice that film school is kind of trying to drill in the heads of the students. And it usually works. Um, I can tell the difference almost nine times out of 10 if I'm working with somebody who has a film school background versus someone who is self-taught. Yeah. Um, and like not ways. saying that one is better than the other, but but I think that, uh, you know, it, it, you see like a lot of this. Like give us some examples. Them. Like what would you, so give me an example, kind of like some things you feel like that really stand out that you can kind of tell immediately, like, oh, this person has so gone to film school even versus. Even something as, as simple as something like storyboarding. Um, yeah. And I know a lot of people who come out of film school who, who don't storyboard, but I think that there's, there's almost this kind of, um, you know, academic take on something like if, if a shoot is, you know, if you're, if you're improvising a shot or if you're like, I'm not sure if that shot's actually going to work anymore or something like that, or you're changing things around. One thing I often hear is, you know, from film school people is just like, oh, well, we should have storyboarded. Yeah. Um, whereas I often find that kind of organic coming up with shots uh, on the day or, or looking at something and going, oh, that would be a great shot. Let's change this to there um, is actually something that makes films better rather than sticking to, you know, uh, uh, like kind of like a Bible of, of production that you need this shot, then this shot, and this shot. Right. Um, I find so it's that, kind you know, of like maybe people who've gone to, to film school sometimes maybe get a little dogmatic in what they've mm-hmm. been taught, perhaps. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a good word for I it. Think yeah. I, I think I've seen that too. Um, and it's, you know, it's probably... Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there definitely, you know, film school is often extremely expensive. And so that's certainly, a, you know, a very real practical consideration. I mean, uh, I, I think a lot of people just flat out couldn't afford it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you certainly, I mean, I don't think there's any question that you don't have to go to film school to become a filmmaker. So first and foremost, so if you're out there listening, you know, by all means, I mean, don't feel like, I just want to say, uh, do not feel like, that this is going to be some kind of, um, you know, obstacle that you're not going to be able to get past. That or like you a have make to go or to break film school. kind of, of your career. Right. Yeah. That it's a make it or break it thing. I mean, please don't. Please don't. Because, you know, especially in today's day and age with all of the, I mean, I do agree with Herzog. I think that, that, that from a logistical standpoint, right, from a technical standpoint, I do think that you can learn... Uh, at least enough to start to get going and to make your own short films. I think that you can learn, right, with just some YouTube videos. There's so many, you know, you can learn the basic fundamentals technologically of, of how to shoot something. And then and then you learn on the job. And, yeah, and then, that's, you know, that's exactly what I was going to say is, is that, that, you know, people will often say the value of film school is that you're learning about, like, these professional environments. But every single time I've been on a set, or at least when I was starting to work on sets, there were no people that were unhappy to teach me something or to explain yeah. something to me. Um, and, you know, rather than paying 
tens of thousands of dollars to to learn or that. Hundreds I'm, I'm of thousands, being paid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm I'm being paid at that point to learn this stuff, which is great. And I think that you know, there's even a huge difference I've noticed on sets of, and I've never run a bigger set. Like all, everything I've directed has always been very indie, very bare bones crew, which I love. Yeah. Um, but every time I've worked on a bigger set, either as a DP or as a camera operator, I've noticed even when there are PAs that the PAs that are at film school or were at film school are are treated differently than the PAs who are self-taught. Not in a oh, um, really? not in a, a negative way. Like it's not like one of them is, is trashed on or anything like that. But yeah. um, you just notice that often the PAs that are were at film school are sort of given more rigid guidelines and, and sort of said, you know, do this, whereas the PAs that weren't at film school are often kind of invited to tag along to bigger jobs that they might not be involved in. Um, and things like that, like so that while the PAs that were at film school, and this actually was is a direct example from a job I worked last year. Um, the PAs that were at film school were all told to kind of set up all the the interview spaces and you know get the the bars up with the the um, cloth and things like that, and the couches all set up. Yeah. And the PAs who um, at this point I was a camera operator, I wasn't working as a PA, but the PAs who w- were not with that program from that film school. Um, yeah, again, they were just kind of invited to tag along to different things and just kind of observe. And they didn't have to, um, you know, necessarily be working and actually setting things up at every every waking moment. They could, they were a lot more, I think, invited to just come on and, and observe the, the process and things like that, which was really interesting. I, I thought that that was kind of a... Yeah, uh, well, a I mean, yeah, thing. I think, you know, I think, you know, my experience, right, it's, there's always a time and a place, but, you know, just a couple of thoughts too. I mean, not to get too far sidetracked into like a how-to as opposed to kind of discussing Herzog's comments, but just real quickly, I mean, you know, depending on where you live, I mean, there are a lot of opportunities to, to learn how to, you know, to learn how to make film. If you've not been to film school, um, you know, some of them seem a little obvious, maybe more so than others, but I mean, you know, obviously, uh, grab a camera any which way you can, and start to make your own films. Uh, there are so many um, resources online. Uh, it's just almost even, you know, it's tough. There's almost too many. But mm-hmm. but certainly you can pick up the, the bare bones kind of minimal stuff. But, you know, like you said, I mean, go be a PA. Uh, there's even if it's a small production in your in your town, uh, you know, go shadow somebody. Uh, people are us- usually people are really open to uh, if, if you're professional, if you're polite, if you're kind, if you're courteous, if you're not pushy and you ask in the right time and place and way, you know, there definitely, you can find people out there who will allow you to shadow them. Yep. There's um, no harm in asking. That's kind of and, what I learned. So, and, yeah. and it's a trade-off, right? I mean, you yeah. know, you can go work for free on a production, uh, in order to basically consider yourself an intern in order to learn. I mean, I've, I've done that myself. I mean, I, you know, even after I kind of had a career and had done stuff, I would, uh, you know, I would offer offer myself up for to be a camera assistant for example for a couple times so that I could learn how to operate a you know a specific type of camera in this mm-hmm. case happened to be a red and I was really curious about using certain type of lenses which they had and so you know I was like well hey I will I'll carry your crap and kind of be uh, a camera assistant here so that I can learn some of this stuff but you know, other ways too you can learn that aren't maybe as obvious is kind of go in a different role. I, you know, I remember when I was first starting out, now I was t- pursuing acting, so it was, you know, felt a little bit more in line, but I ended up learning a lot more about what the crew did than I did about acting as a background actor mm-hmm. and so I, I would I, I would you know I did this for a few months I wouldn't suggest doing it for very long because there's you know definitely a lot of diminishing returns but for you know for a handful of times you know that was a way that I could get on a totally I mean you know the biggest sets out there I mean we're talking major studio feature films major studio television shows I'm standing right there watching the actors work watching the crew work you know and what you you're able to learn about the hierarchy of who does what and how to say I mean, it was extraordinary what I could learn and I'm being paid to do it. And because, you know, it's, it's like you're standing around doing nothing 99% of the time when you're a background performer. Um, performer's a stretch, but, uh, you know, when you're in background. But, you, I mean, you can learn so much if you just pay attention. So I think uh, and sort of in line with Herzog's philosophy, too, I think that my personal take on us all, too, is like even if I wasn't making money in any of this, I would still be doing it. Yeah. Um, I'm really lucky to be able to make money doing this and, and to be yeah. doing what I love. And even, you know, I, I had no dreams that I would be working even on indie sets as a cinematographer as quickly as I did. And I was really lucky to have gotten there, you know, faster than a lot of people do get there. But um, 
I think that even if I wasn't making money, even if I wasn't doing that as a job, I would, you know, absolutely still be making movies on my own as, you know, even at a loss, I would be, yeah. I would be doing. And, and most of the things that I've made thus far have been at a loss. They're, they're there because I, you know, I liked to do them and especially with personal projects and things like that. Like I'm not selling these to any big studios and getting, getting, uh, you know, royalties back or anything like that. I, right. I usually just release them online for free because I don't really care about, um, you know, making a huge paycheck off of my own things at this point. When I can well, do that, yeah. that'll be great. But but at yeah. the moment, it's just one of those things that I'm like, you know, I'm well, doing it because investment. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it is, yeah, for sure. And maybe that's part of a little bit of what it means to be a soldier of cinema, to work through those tough times. But, and you know, there are lessons further down the road here where Herzog does talk about, you know, financing projects and mm-hmm. yeah. developing a career. And we can kind of definitely dive more into those topics when we get there. But, you know, another thing that Herzog mentions in this lesson uh, is, you know, and it, which is, it's crazy to think about. I mean, it's it's so interesting to think he talks about how, you know, he grew up in the middle of the Bavarian Alps and it, Alps. Uh, uh, and he didn't see a you know a film until he was eleven, which yeah. is a, which is extraordinary. Of course, like most of you listening here, myself included, and you too, Colin. I mean, we've been so steeped in in film and television, you know, from the from the our most infantile times. Probably, I mean, it's hard to even imagine. Um, and that's probably a big part of why his voice is so singular and unique because yeah, he wasn't steeped distinct. in so much of that. Yeah, but um, you know, Herzog recommends watching films. Which is, you know, and we're going to find uh, that this is this happens very right with great regularity with Herzog. You know, he kind of says like, well, hey, I didn't see films until I was 11. And then he's like, I suggest you watch films to learn how to make films. It's kind of a funny irony, or, you know, a little bit. But um, but Herzog talks about, you know, watching films um, uh, to learn. And uh, he uses a specific film in that lesson, uh, Viva Zapata. As yeah. an example, he kind of just showcases, he's like, hey, you know, here's a great example of like um, of a character introduction of Marlon Brando's character in that film. And he kind of walks through that opening scene there. Um, but uh, I, a little bit of, you know, for you, how important was that uh, watching other films? Did that was that a big part of your inspiration? Do you feel like it was a big part of your learning? Um, oh, I mean, without being by process of osmosis, absolutely. Um, yeah. Like even if you're not actually actively watching films to learn something from them, you're just going to take inspiration from the things that you like. Um, but I also, you know, on a flip side of that, I, I don't watch that many movies. Strangely enough, I don't. Um, you know, like probably now average, or, or kind of ever. Well, I mean, average before quarantine, I would say, was about maybe twice a week. And now it's probably one every two weeks. And okay. I think that's just because I've been I've like been film. trying to cre- yeah films. And I think that's yeah. because I've been trying to create a lot and been trying to kind of get well, things. Like, what about what about when you were young? Do you kind of oh, do you have um, an indicate like were you, were you like a, a film fiend when you yes, were little? I was or? definitely. I was well. I was I, I was the type of person that would watch. You know, I would watch the entirety of Lord of the Rings, and then I would watch the. 50 hours of behind the scenes of the oh, Lord you're of the Rings so movies young. afterwards. And, <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I mean, that was insane, <laughs> but like same with Jaws. Like I would watch Jaws and then I would watch the yeah. entire behind the scenes making of, I would watch every facet of those things. Even when I had, you know, I remember one of the earlier things I had was the Star Wars special editions on VHS. Nice. And those ones were the ones where you couldn't just select the, the you know, obviously there were no menus on VHS. So right, right. Um, you would have to, you know, watch the whole movie, and then after the credits rolled, you would get the the behind-the-scenes kind of special edition... That's awesome. ...making ofs and things like that. So I remember doing that. And I think, honestly, if you looked at those tapes, the parts of the tapes that would be completely worn down would be the parts of the special, like the making ofs. Because I... You know, I would just... I would watch those over and over, and watching, you know, Empire Strikes Back, them going to... I think it was Norway, and, and being on location. It was just such... It was like... It was like watching Indiana Jones and realizing that you could be Indiana Jones without really the danger of it. That, that you know, as a director, you could go and still live out all these experiences. Yeah. But, but you're there and you're getting paid and you're making something that's right, really Right, that it's actually like an art and a craft and yeah. could potentially be a profession. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, you know, and Herzog talks about that too. And, uh, you know, about how he kind of first realized that, that film was, that there was an artifice, that it was fake, that, you know, he mentions uh, that he noticed that uh, the exact same footage was, was used a couple times in a film. And he's like, wait a minute, I, I just saw that, you know, that same guy fall off that, you know, whatever it was. And that was kind of like an awakening 
awakening for him like oh wait a minute this is actually this is a crafted thing this is kind you know and um it's you so so interesting that you talk about you know uh when you were young, having access to all of these behind the scenes, you know, featurettes and the making ofs and director's commentaries and things, you know, of course, people of my generation, we didn't have any of that. So, you know, uh, that all of the the kind of infrastructure of infra, I mean, everybody knows what IMDb is now. Everybody mm-hmm. knows box office reports. Everybody know you know, there's so much making of, and that's, that's just part of the marketing of films now is kind of the story of how they're made. I mean, you know, some of my favorite films, it's like, you know, I pop in my alien DVD or Blu-ray and, you know, there's the film is two hours long and there's like eight hours of, of, you know, features, yeah, documentary, of, right? documentaries, yeah. right. Uh, it's like mind blowing. But, you know, we like a lot of people like myself, a uh, generation, we didn't have any of that. And I'm curious, like, you know, I don't have any specific recollection like Herzog does of when I realized that filmmaking was a thing that, you know, uh, professional people did. And this was actually a career and there were actors and there were directors, you know, and all this kind of I can't really remember when that was. But um, but uh, but I am definitely a fan of that making of content like you are. Well, I think it's it's interesting, too, because I've, I've heard so, like even. Peter, you know, to go back to Lord of the Rings, but uh, Peter Jackson basically has said that, you know, you don't need, why go to film school when you've essentially got a, you know, 25 hour film school in the making of those DVDs, right? Like you Uh, go through every single facet of of the production of those movies. That's a really, yeah, that's a really great point, you know, and it's, uh, so that, yeah, so there is just, you know, another resource that people have today that they didn't have before. And, Mm -hmm. you know, some some of these commentaries, some of these making ofs are definitely more useful than others. Uh, I, and, and for different reasons but uh absolutely uh you know especially you know go find your favorite films go find films that really speak to you that touch you and see if there's a director commentary or a making of um and uh, a lot of times these may even be on youtube or other places online uh if not definitely on the dvd or blu-ray or uh, uhd discs and uh some of them are extraordinarily insightful so yeah good point another great resource i um it's interesting. I don't know if there's any way we could really, you know, come to any true understanding of it. But I wonder if there, if that makes any difference, you know, the generations younger who grew up just almost since birth, you know, steeped in this making of content versus people who didn't have any access to this, you know, and we had to kind of figure out our own, like, you know, what was going on. It, I mean, I definitely feel like it kept the, 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 the creative process a mystery for me. Until yeah. much, much later in life, you know, I, I do, I do very, you know, I do remember thinking like, these aren't even like real human beings. Like, what is this magic? You know, not, not literally, but I mean, you know, like, who are these people? Well, like, it's like Herzog says about the guy falling off the cliff and then in a later yeah. battle scene, he falls off the cliff again. And it's this realization of like, oh, there's something being manipulated here. There's, this isn't just real. Um, well, or I just meant like, uh, yeah, there's that, but it was just like, I, I guess what I was trying to say is that I, it, it took me so much later in life to realize that this was something that maybe I could do mm, Yeah, okay. Be- because, yeah. because it didn't seem like real people. I mean, I grew up in Missouri. I grew up in the Midwest to non-artistic parents. I mean, it was, you know, so that's part of it there. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, it was like, maybe, I don't know. I was just, I'm just kind of wondering out loud. It's like, I wonder if had, I've been exposed to, you know, uh, to, to these making us more of this stuff. I'd be like, oh, yeah, they're just people like this. is These are just like normal people like anybody else. And this is just a job, basically, you know. But, yeah, I mean, it just seemed like such a mystery to me for so long. And, and I think that some of that even kind of sticks with me to this day, you know, where I'm like, I hold the process in such kind of awe you know i'm in i'm in such awe of it you know films that i really really love i mean herzog even kind of you know in his films i'm just like wow (laughs) dude you know just yeah just like how did they pull this off yeah so i don't know i mean what are your thoughts on that it's like obviously there's no like right or wrong answer but what do you think just having grown up with all that stuff to go back to jaws i think that jaws was the first time that i ever was affected by a movie subconsciously that like i got out of watching jaws and and i didn't want to slip out of bed because i thought i was going to slip into the ocean and to get over that fear (laughs) i love it but but to get over that fear i i I went and i watched all the making of of it um yeah probably six i want to say six or seven at the time oh wow and um i just sat down and watched the entire making of the movie and then suddenly the movie wasn't scary for me anymore suddenly it was you know 
yeah. watching that movie. And there's still there's frightening scenes in it, of course, that still affected me and still do to this day. But the movie itself wasn't this thing that was creeping into my real life. Now it was something that I was like, how do I get into that position where I can scare people and I can get into, you know, yeah. get into to making a giant shark? And a lot of that for me was actually it, it came in through... Um, stop motion because I had kind of unlimited budgets when you when you think about that it's very similar to people who do you know other types of animation is that um, or even something like writing a book is that you don't really have a budget for those things you can do whatever you want so I had all these Lego sets and suddenly you know I had a dinosaur battle in my movie whereas that would cost millions and millions of dollars to do on a real set I had these little Lego things that I could play around with and, there you go and um, all the time in the world time yeah, and, and imagination and, and, and it's taught Legos. me also the kind of the hardships of it too because it's the amount of times that the T-Rex's head would fall off or something like that and I kind of learned how how difficult it is kind of logistically to make these things um but no, I, I think kind of to more answer your question, I, I think that what it did for me is it, it set up a real expectation and, a, and quite an accurate expectation about what it's like to be on those sets. You know, mm. the one I think the one really great thing about a lot of those behind the scenes making of uh, content things is that they usually don't sugarcoat things. Um, you know, if something goes wrong, it's usually kind of, if anything, the focus of those, those documentaries, as opposed to a lot of other things that kind of just show you the happy side of it, or just show you the, the, you know, the everyone cheering along and being, being happy together and, and singing right. Kumbaya. Cause, cause those documentary, those documentaries are kind of trying to tell their own story, right? Yeah. And yeah. what there, there's no story if there's no conflict. So that's an interesting point. So it sounds like maybe you felt like those things kind of gave you a more realistic expectation that like mm -hmm, for sure, hey, for sure. It's hard this is like hard work just like anything else. I mean yeah, interesting man. Hadn't thought of that. Yeah, I mean it, it, it really I think um prepared me in that in that kind of weird way to, to yeah. be like I know uh you know even even on a very basic level of of just set procedure of like, you know, you yeah. learn why the clapperboard is there. You learn why, you know, what's the boom operator doing while people are, are setting up the lights and things like that. And you just kind of learn uh, and this it's whole... Like, yeah, this and it's like idea. tedium. I mean, I think yeah. it's like, uh, it kind of, I think that's, you know, it's it, even uh, Herzog mentions this. I mean, you know, I, it's clear that Herzog, uh, this is what he spent his entire life doing. It's just clearly his passion. And, you know, even he is like, God, you know, filmmaking can be such profound tedium. It's like mind numbing. You know, I've like yes. literally heard him describe it that yeah. way. And God, I mean, if anybody's been on a set, you know, it's like, it really can. I mean, it can, it can be, be just grinding. Yeah. Grinding. I yeah. mean, just grinding. So it's, you know, that's interesting. So yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, so you were kind of exposed to more of the realities of filmmaking at a much younger age. And, you know, it frankly, to be honest, uh, I, I didn't have any exposure to that or understanding of it until much, much, much later in life. I mean, probably didn't really get, you know, an act an, an accurate gist of that until I actually started, you know, uh, being on sets and it was like, oh my gosh, wait, 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 well, then it's kind a little of... bit of action. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. You know, like... yeah, you just kind of, yeah. I, well, I've got a kind of funny anecdote too, that I, I watched George Melier at a very young age. Um, like the voyage to the moon and stuff. And, yeah. you know, as many people might know, George Melia was a magician. And so that's kind of always how I thought of film. Like ever since I was a really young kid was that it's, it's essentially an illusion. It's an, yeah. Yeah, it's an optical illusion. It is, it is like, we are the magicians going out and, and, and creating these magic shows. And, um, that's one of, and the same way I've never really been super into magic. Like, it's not like I ever had a, I was never like one of those kids that would pull out cards and do card tricks and things like that. But I've always <laughs> been in, more interested, if anything, in pulling back that curtain and, and learning how those tricks are, are done. And in very much the same way, that was kind yeah. of where my interest lied in film. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, well, it, you know, it, and so like we mentioned, these are, these can be powerful inspirations, powerful tools of education and inf information. Um, I'm just curious, like what were a few, like a handful of like those films that were the biggest inspirations to you? Do you kind of remember that? Um, oh, totally, yeah. mentions a couple of hymns, but his, but I'm just curious kind of what, uh, 
what do you feel like or were a handful of the films that were most inspirational to you as a kid where you were like, I want to do this? Pretty much all of um, Hitchcock's big ones, uh, you know, Psycho, North by Northwest, Vertigo. Yeah, I mean, my dad was a big wow. Hitchcock fan, so I, I watched a lot of those as, as a pretty cool. little kid. Um, North okay. by Northwest, everything like that. Rear Window. You're not was trying my, to like sound my... fancy here now, are you? No, no, no. Colin? I remember I, okay. Rear Window was like my favorite <laughs> movie as a kid. And wow. Was, and and uh, yeah, that was that movie. And I just made a rear window parody just a few months ago. So there you go. Um, but I, I, can, um, I mean, I, I, that's extraordinary. I, I feel like as a kid, I probably would have been so profoundly bored by that film. I mean, just to be <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I don't think that I I, I had the patience or you know attention to. I think have it was been... the hyping up my dad did. My dad would always talk about these movies as though they were like terrifying. So I, I couldn't be bored because I was just waiting for the next scary moment in them and, oh, and thinking cool. at all times that I was going to be horrified so you know especially so her- with psycho and things like that yeah yeah so, so okay so hitchcock's larger films but any what else what else were some it's jaws um, you mentioned jaws already jaws, so yeah, think, yeah jaws i mean as i said jaws was kind of the first time i was ever really actively involved like scared by a movie beyond yeah. just the screening that i that i kind of like realized that you, you could for yeah and i, I, had, yeah. I had no understanding of why that was but it was something that even just in a really young age you still sort of get that in your head that you can like oh they did something to me even if i can't put it into words as to why yeah um jaws i i loved a lot of old westerns things like uh, a lot of john fords and um oh wow you know again my, my dad was born in 1955 so it's kind of what he grew up with right um, so i think that's likely why a lot of that was passed on to me um Very cool. and things like a bridge too far like i was obsessed with with war movies as a kid too i remember one of the sure. first bigger movies that i made with a friend was we made this stop motion uh, D Day movie about, and we used the you know the little plastic army men and stuff like that, and we had these sweeping <laughs> battle shots where my friend would be zooming in on the the little figures dying, and I would be pouring tomato sauce on them and things like that. So, but it was again like even then that. it was like I, it was I'd an like illusion that. because he would pan the camera to the left, and I would run to all the figures on the right and knock a few of them over and pour the stuff over, and then he would pan back to the right, and I'd run around <laughs> the camera and, and all the things that were off screen. So again, it was like a magic show where you're you're yeah. showing. You're not showing the trick. You're just being kind of revealing. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really yeah. It's it's a it's a very interesting and I think accurate analogy to make. And cinema is definitely illusion. There's no question to that. And and often, uh, hopefully, it's quite magical. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's it, that's that's really interesting. It, that Herzog. It's uh, and and older Spielberg flick. That even though you're much younger than me your inspirations are films that were because they were kind of passed down from your father, uh, that they're older films. Uh, interesting. I think like for me, you know, my inspirations were, I grew up, you know, well, grew up in the eighties mostly, but I was born in 76. So, uh, just so jaws would be a great example to Spielberg's earlier stuff. I also, but I, I kind of had a, (laughs) not as, uh, uh, highfalutin inspirations as yours. I kind of was raised on a lot of genre flicks. So, mm-hmm. like your father was watching, you know, Hitchcock and and John Ford. I my father was watching uh, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes and <laughs> Mad hey, Max. Man, those are a lot and, of fun. <laughs> and Mad Max and The Road Warrior and Poltergeist and you know uh, these kind of films. Um, I, I grew later to really appreciate uh, Hitchcock and you know some of these other. But yeah, I, I kind of grew up and was inspired by uh, a lot of genre B picks, um, but uh, specifically Mad Max and The Road Warrior. Those were two films that really, really stood out in my mind as uh, just the physicality of those films. And I think that's something that I really enjoy about Herzog's films um, uh, is that his films are very physical. And, you know, it, it, I just want to make a quick I don't you know, it's like, well, who cares? We could kind of get off on all kinds of topics. But, you know, one of the things that Herzog mentions consistently is that, you know, he explains why people are like, why in the world did you drag that uh, that ship over the mountain in Fitzcarraldo? though? Like, why in the world would you do that? And 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 explaining his motivations for that and explaining many other of his motivations, he says, because I want people to be able to believe their eyes. People can't believe their eyes anymore when you're watching like a Lord of the Rings, for example, or mm-hmm. any other number of films, all of the uh, Marvel movies. You can't believe your eyes. Everything is fake. Everything is fake in these films. I mean, everything. Um 
And I think that's, you know, obviously I wouldn't, wasn't able to articulate it, but as a kid, Mad Max and, and especially the Road Warrior, you, you could believe your eyes. And they're tangible, right? They're, they're real, they're... but it's like, you really know this is happening. Yeah, These are feel real it. people, you know, they're moving at speed. These are real people. They are actually performing these stunts. This is really happening. And there is just something, and we can go into this, you know, later when he touches, when Herzog kind of talks about this more in other lessons. But I, I think there is a very significant, real impact. And I think that um, there is definitely something there. Uh, the difference between being able to believe your eyes and really, um, and not, and not being able to believe your eyes, right? It's like, mm -hmm. so to take it back to this magic analogy, right? It's like, if you've got a magician performing tricks in front of you, and, and you're just like, uh, I can see the trick, I know what you're doing, you're completely removed. There's like no immersion, you're, you know, right? I mean, that's kind of the point. If you already know how the trick's done, or you, or they are not good magicians, and you can see how the trick is being done, it's not really magic, is it? You're, you're, mm -hmm. It's not very entertaining. It's, but it's, a, it's an illusion show. Which but, is, but if, but even like, then, it's but not if really. You know, right? it's, it, but yeah. if the magician is extraordinary and you're sitting there in front of them, and yes, you know it's magic. Like You know that it's not. they're not actually really manipulating time and space and breaking the laws of physics, but you can't figure it out. It's like they're really doing it. The physicality of that, of like, wow, whatever they're doing is so exceptional. I cannot, you know, this is like real. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, you know, because obviously it's like, you know, it's a film, you know, this isn't really a post apocalyptic world where there's no gasoline and uh, people are, you know, killing each other over a drop of gas, you know, that's not real. But within that, what they're doing is real and visceral and physical and tangible. So it's, I think that's one of the things that really stands out for me for Herzog's films that, uh, that kind of draws me to them. But yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Herzog talks about, this is kind of interesting, right? Because this could be pretty subjective. He talks about, you know, consuming good film, um, uh, you know, and we just use kind of some examples here, right? I mean, your, your example of Herzog and Jaws, my example of George Miller and Mad Max. And, you know, what do you think good cinema is? Now, it's totally subjective, of course, but, you know, Herzog's talking about exposing yourself to good cinema. Do you think, what do you think that, ha like, what, what meaning do you think that has? Is there any objective meaning to that? I mean, or I kind is of just get two, not to, yeah. not to say that it, everything can be organized into those two meanings, but um, on one hand, it's something that is, you know, not necessarily critically acclaimed, but but well regarded, well received. Something like a Godfather that is very clearly, you know, everyone kind of agrees. That's it's like a, in the canon. Yeah, yeah that's like, a good yeah. classic movie. And and the other time would be, I would say, so really anything that you can learn from. Um, you know, like I've I've had great experiences watching some movies that aren't necessarily the the best. Like Ed Wood, I love Ed Wood <laughs> and a hey, lot that's of a his great movies. Movie. Yeah, I think that. Oh, you no, mean but I mean, I mean even Wood. his not, his not, real, uh, his, yeah, not the Tim. Yeah. I do love the Tim Burton one. Um, okay, gotcha, gotcha. But, so but, actual Ed Ed Wood's actual films that he directed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And I, I find that those are so interesting. Is it's basically just watching this dude that has such a passion, but he's so misguided in so many ways, and you kind of learn. Okay, what you know what could I have done differently? What could I, you know, and things yeah. like that, which I think is really, really valuable for. So you can learn from films that aren't technically, I guess, great. Right. Yeah, I mean, exactly. yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I think you can. Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah. So that would maybe be a little bit where we might differ from Herzog's comments here, but I agree. I mean, I think, and I think good cinema exists everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that good cinema can exist in a, in a genre flick, uh, good cinema can exist in a studio film, uh, good cinema can exist in any country in any language in any era. Um, good is certainly subjective. I think ultimately, you know, what speaks to you? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah, but I think you're right, though. I mean, I think it's worth, you know, even if you have to kind of push yourself, you know, uh, especially today, it's so easy to do so with, you know, all of these, you know, Netflix, Hulu, Criterion Collection is online, mm -hmm. all of these different uh, resources. I think it is good to push yourself past maybe just what you've been watching. You know, you can say get you, burnt out real fast, too. I think that's the thing when you just watch like a, a, you know, a, a list type, of yeah. your list of just like, oh, I want to see this i want to see this you know yeah throwing something different to the mix can be a really lovely surprise and really refreshing try, 
try different genres, try right. different eras, try different, you know, countries, try different. Yeah. Um, at push yourself. I mean, I, and I have to do this a little bit, you know, it's like, uh, I think all of us or most of us probably kind of fall back into the things that are most, that are comfort zone, so to speak, you know, it's like, well, I know that I love this genre or I know I love this director or I maybe don't like to read subtitles or whatever your thing is, you know, I think it's really a, a good thing to at least occasionally push yourself and um and and go watch some other films i think you can learn so much from watching some silent era films that you can learn so much from watching foreign language films you can learn so much from watching yeah so um absolutely absolutely i think um be i think it's like watching with a conscious intent maybe is is an important aspect another aspect to kind of um talk a little bit about about something else that Herzog says in his, his opening lesson is this universality and this these universal rules of film and I think that oh, watching yeah, yeah. films from different genres, watching films from different countries yep. are a great way to introduce yourself into like what are universal rules and what do they mean? Good what point. you know, I can watch a yeah. movie in Japan and I can watch a movie in made in, you know, Texas and I can mute them both and I can still understand what's going on if the filmmaker is visually minded and, and kind of is great right. at visual storytelling. And there's there's universal rules there that carry off internationally in, in any any movie. And um, Right. There's some that do and some that don't. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point. It's a really good point is to kind of see and that's, you know, watching films from different eras, uh, everything from different, you know, the, the grammar or language of film has been solidified for the most part for quite a while, but there are Mm -hmm. definite differences. And, you know, you go back in time and you see not only differences in acting style, but you see different philosophies of storytelling. You see different uh, camera subjectivity, uh, different editing. And so, yeah, I mean, that's a good point to kind of compare different films from different countries, different languages, different eras, and kind of see what, what is universal amongst these things and what isn't. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So really good point. Yeah. Um, and I think you mentioned that you can kind of watch and absorb through osmosis. Uh, and you can also, you know, what I often do is I'll kind of my first my first watch of a film will be like that. Exactly. I'm just an audience. I'm just hanging out here. Mm-hmm. I want to be entertained. I want to get sucked into the film. And if it's a film that stands out to me for whatever reason, then I think, you know, I go back and I watch it. Okay. Let's, I want to kind of break down here. Let's see what they're doing. Um, you know, what, what did they do that made me feel this way or what stood out to me, you know, and kind of just analyze it on a different level. So you can always do that too. Let's, you can enjoy a film on multiple levels. Um, and perhaps to kind of even, if anything, kind of wrap up the all, all the conversation or all the topics we've had it, it, i've actually heard people that i that i know who went to film school whose teachers told them i always advise reading this script or the screenplay before you watch the movie uh, yeah. which is bizarre to me which is completely the antithesis of anything you should be doing <laughs> because you should be watching the movies after. as the directors intended and then yeah. if you want to do the research afterwards but but you know to give yourself a preconceived notion or to give yourself you know this that is interesting entirely that's different, weird yeah it's it's really and it's i've heard it from multiple people from comment. multiple different um film schools and it's like why would why on earth Before. I, can't, I can't think of any yeah. positive maybe some that. maybe yeah maybe somebody listening can kind of give us you know shoot us an email and let us know yeah. uh why that is i mean i have often read a script after yeah. Uh, yeah. Many, 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 many times I've read a script afterward, um, but I don't think I've ever read a script prior. No, uh, me neither. Yeah. I, in fact, I would be actively avoiding doing so yeah, if, I, I, if, I, if I saw a screenplay from a movie. And I, re- uh, you know. I remember when Hateful Eight script was leaked before the film came out, and mm. I was like, don't even get me close to that. Yeah. It's like the last thing in, I, in the world I want is to have the film ruined for me because I've read the script beforehand. Um, yeah. 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 All right. Cool. Well, I uh, did we were to did we miss anything else that uh, that Herzog covered there in those first couple lessons? Um, I think um, we pretty much touched on almost everything, man. Yeah. Um, it, it is. You know, I just want to go back quickly. Cause he because he uses a specific example. I think is like is really helpful. It's funny. He kind of is not not making fun of, but kind of calling out. He's like, you know, I I talk to a lot of film students. And he's like, they think film history started at Star Wars. Yeah. You know, what is that? Seventy-seven. Yes. I can't. Is it seventy-seven yeah, Star Wars? Yeah. 
And it, it's so amazing to me to think, I mean, it, first of all, I'm old. So Star Wars is within my lifetime, just barely. <laughs> but uh, so it's hysterical to think that people, you know, kind of have the might have this thought that film history started in 77. But uh, but, you know, I guess I guess it's possible. Um, I mean, that's that, the irony there is that film is very old, but also very new, which is kind of an inter- it's, it's an interesting art for that reason that you can literally go back to, you know, a Western made in 1902 was yeah. technically a contemporary movie. Then it wasn't set it in the old West. It was set in present yeah. day for them, which I always <laughs> well, talk about why the Western to me is such an interesting genre to go through because you literally yeah. essentially go through modern inter- iterations of life in the West that are being recorded in real time. And then Just, you yeah. get up to this, this romanticized vision of the frontier and all that. Um, yeah. That's another conversation for another, for another conversation, time. <laughs> but, very, but you're right. I mean, it, it, I think in, in, in overall perspective, film is a pretty young art form. Yes. Yeah. When you compare it to music and painting, sculpture, uh, writing, of course, those art forms have been, uh, have been around for, much, 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 much longer than moving pictures. And if anything, um, that's why you should try to expose yourself to all of it because it's not really that difficult to do. Yeah, it's not it's impossible. Not, yeah, it's not hard yeah. to, to really go back in time and, and, and examine older movies. There's not, you know... Absolutely, not absolutely. That yeah. Um, all right, well... I think we've just about covered uh, most of the major topics that uh, Herzog himself covered in these first couple lessons of mm-hmm. Masterclass. So we will go ahead and wrap it up now, and we'll cover the next couple lessons in our next episode. But uh, Colin, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I had a blast, and I'm yeah. looking forward. I'm looking forward to our future episodes, uh, and I'm excited to see um, what kind of feedback we get from this. And I hope you listening out there enjoyed it. And uh, we'll look forward to hanging out with you next time, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see you guys. All right. Until then, signing off.